Well, good morning. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Harry Colbert, Jr. I am the editor-in-chief of North News, and North News is the community newspaper in North Minneapolis. We come out on the last Friday of every month, and we circulate 10,000 copies to our wonderful Northside community. So with that being said, I'd like to welcome the audience to the first installment of the Northside Economic Opportunity Network Community Conversation Series 2.0 hosted by Warren McLean with guests Senator Tina Smith, Attorney General Keith Ellison, and Representative Ilhan Omar. Previous conversations shared community perspectives on developing North Minneapolis, the impact of COVID-19 on Northside food businesses, and economic trends and policies influencing Northside's future. You can view these conversations at neon-mn.org that's neon-mn.org. I'd like to welcome and introduce Warren McLean, series host and president of the Northside Economic Opportunity Network, or NEON. NEON builds the capacity of small businesses and entrepreneurs in North Minneapolis to grow community vitality and economic prosperity. He leads NEON in delivering the resources, know-how, and business expertise to minority-led and locally-owned businesses, helping them to develop, launch, and flourish. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Warren McLean. Thank you, everybody. So, Harry, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and thank you to all of our current sponsors who make the uh, Community Conversation Series 2.0 possible. And I'll just call off their names, Best Buy, uh, Key Investment, J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, API Group, Mortensen, Thrivent, Lana Lakes, Midwest One Bank, XL Energy, JADT Group, Northeast Bank, and Sunrise Bank. So thank you all. Give them all a round of applause for their support for our work. Turn it back to you. A historically black neighborhood North Minneapolis has been subjected to de decades of systematic disinvestment, creating some of Minnesota's widest racial disparities in health, wealth, and quality of life outcomes. Despite these forces, Northside is home to tremendous potential and vibrant entrepreneurial communities, working to close gaps and create a thriving Twin Cities destination. The purpose of community conversations is to explore the vision, challenges, collaborations, and exciting work ahead, building a revitalized North Minneapolis powered by homegrown businesses, organizations, and community leaders. At this time, I'd like to introduce our guest. Senator Tina Smith serves as a U.S. Senator for Minnesota. She's a fierce advocate for Minnesotans and is focused on continuing the progressive legacy of the seat which she holds. Since coming to the United States Senate in 2018, Senator Smith has worked to create economic opportunities for families, businesses, and communities across the state. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Tina Smith. <laughs> attorney General Keith Ellison is Minnesota's 30th Attorney General. <laughs> the first African American and the first Muslim American elected to statewide office in Minnesota. Guided by generosity and inclusion, he serves his role as the people's lawyer to help Minnesotans afford their lives and live with dignity, safety, and respect. Attorney General Keith Ellison. Representative Ilhan Omar represents Minnesota's 5th Congressional District in the United States House of Representatives. She is the first woman of color to represent Minnesota in this capacity, and she is the first American refugee to join Congress. She believes in building a more inclusive and compassionate culture that allows our economy to flourish and encourages civic participation. Ladies and gentlemen, Representative <laughs> Ilhan Omar.
Now, as I've mentioned, in previous conversations, we've discussed the impacts of COVID-19 and civil unrest on small businesses in North Minneapolis, the implications of economic trends and policy for Northsiders and their future, and the cross-sector co collaborations driving development. Today, with the help of our elected representatives, we're exploring policy objectives and the ways that they support small, black, indigenous, people of color owned businesses and organizations like NEON working to build access to financing and expertise for sustained entrepreneurial growth. I'd like to start the discussion with a question for our president of NEON. Um, Mr. McLean, what government policies support small business development and economic development are the most impactful for NEON and your clients? And then a second question onto that is, can you share some specific examples on how government policy impacts your clients uh, for better or for worse? Uh, yeah, I will do that. But first, I'm going to go slightly off script, and I'm going to give my own introduction of the panel here. <laughs> Uh, Not so. doing so well so far. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President. So, uh, so I first want to introduce uh, uh, Senator, uh, the Honorable Senator Tina Smith. Um, you know, all of the panelists have been chosen because of their support for NEON, and it's been, I wouldn't call it a, a one-off. They're really authentic partners of our organization. And so uh, Senator Smith was very instrumental in um, helping one of our one of my staff members, her husband, Ann Fix, uh, her husband was in the epicenter of uh, the COVID-19. He actually lived in Wuhan um, when the COVID-19 outbreak mm. occurred. And so China went into lockdown and was preventing anyone from leaving the city at that point and obviously from there the country. And uh, Ann reached out to Senator Smith's office and they worked with her, and they, the office, worked with her on a daily basis to get him home, got him a seat on an airplane, and got him back in the United States, which was just a thrill for Ann. And so we really want to thank you, Senator thank Smith, you. for that. Thank you. Thank um, you so much. And so um, I'm just honored. And, and, I, and, and the, Great job. And the culmination of that is that Ann's husband, um, Yulin, became a U.S. citizen just last week. <laughs> so, uh, in addition, uh, Senator Smith made a visit to our office last year on a, on a Saturday to visit with our staff to just walk through our needs in North Minneapolis. So again, thank you for, for that. Um, and then uh, uh, Attorney General Ellison um, has also been a supporter of NEON for a number of years as he preceded um, Congresswoman Omar in the 5th District. But at that time, uh, NEON was fledgling. Uh, we were sort of on the mat at one point, and he went out and got an earmark for us uh, to keep us surviving. I like earmarks. <laughs> Back in the day. I got no problem with earmarks. <laughs> and brought us off the mat, and so now we're here today. So uh, he's part of the key critical legacy of NEON, so we want to thank you for that. Absolutely. Uh, and, then, and, it, and he's still involved, so there's, a, there's an organization, there's a company that had an opportunity to invest uh, in the state of Minnesota, and so um, uh, uh, Attorney General Ellison uh, reached out to that company and said, you know, you need to invest in under-resourced communities. And I've got some ideas for you. <laughs> and so he called me personally <laughs> and said, Warren, I want to tell you about this opportunity. Anyway, that uh, company is now a grantor uh, of NEON. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> And then uh, Congresswoman uh, Omar, her office uh, regularly contacts us about legislation. And, um, and they don't do it in a cursory manner. So, and Talia, for instance, uh, will call us and say, you know, what's your guys' thoughts on this and this project of this legislation? And, uh, and so we, we respond to her. And she said, no, no, I don't want a cursory answer. I want you to tell us in detail what you want to see happen. And, uh, and so we spend time. And so we've had, a, I would call it, very rich discussions about what the legislation will look like and helping to shape it. So I thank you for that. In addition to that, uh, Congresswoman Omar has got, uh, we're at the final stages of a $1 million earmark. It's passed the full house. 
and they were, we're looking forward to having the Senate pass it as well. So thank you for that. So, great job. So with that introduction, now I'll tell you about, I'll respond to the question. So. <laughs> and, and, and I'll recap the question. It basically is what government and policies support around small businesses development <clears throat> and economic development are most impactful for NEON and for your clients? And then also, can you give us some specific examples? Sure. So, I mean, the CARES Act was, was critical. I mean, obviously it poured resources into community and under that was the Paycheck Protection Program, the IDLE program, and programs like that, um, which were obviously helpful because they brought resources into the state. They, they also provided a lot of grant funding, which is what our clients needed at the time and still need. And also uh, the ARP, American Rescue uh, Program, also is going to bring resources into the state, which are critical to our community. And so uh, that's been extremely helpful. Um, I would say, though, with respect to specific policies, um, right now the ARP is about to, the state's about to, to um, make a significant about $35 million, $70 million in grants overall, but $35 million that will be targeted towards the seven county area in the Twin Cities, um, which is fabulous. Um, of that $35 million that will come into our community, uh, the seven county area, 18 million will go to micro businesses, which is extraordinary. Uh, 10 million will go to minority owned businesses. And so 28 million of that 35 million will come to um, businesses that we specifically work with, BIPOC businesses, um, or at least you know, our clients that have an access, opportunity for access to that, those resources. In addition to that, $3 million of that 35 million will go to cultural cor corridors, which is again an opportunity for our community. Um, but the one issue that I would say that's somewhat of a major challenge is that the window of opportunity for our businesses to apply for those grants is 10 days. <laughs> okay, and so that's kind of a major structural impediment <laughs> because if you are going to apply, and our businesses, many of them don't have the, you know, there's a, there's a digital divide. Mm -hmm. So many of them don't have the, the capacity um, without our help in terms of helping to, to, to bridge that divide. And so, you know, last year when this grants were made as well, we actually had to, uh, we made house calls. We literally went to people's homes, walked them through the application, and so that they could then apply for the grant and get it. So, um, you know, the picture I'm thinking about is, you know, it's like an ocean trying to drive water through a nipple. I mean, it's just, you know. <laughs> The problem is that it's a lot of resources, but we have a 10-day window. So, if, and that's legislated, so it's not like the state's decision. It was in the legislation, so that that's a challenge. So, when we're talking about some of the challenges, what uh, this pandemic has uh, kind of shown is we have a lot of people who are in what is called the gig economy. Uh, and you have a lot of businesses that were operating as a business but maybe didn't have all of their paperwork in order. Has NEON come in counter with those type of businesses and how are you able to help them navigate, especially when you're talking about um, these opportunities that are, have come and gone like that? Um, so how are you helping them to get their, their paperwork in order and to take advantage of some of the resources that are out there to help their business? Uh, well, you know, our staff has, like I said, literally gone to people's homes. Um, last year when you really couldn't go out, some people were sending us, actually sending their social security information over the phone because they put that, that, that level of trust. And we were filling out the applications for them and submitting them to, um, to the bank and to all the, you know, and to, with the accounting firms to get um, some of the PPP money uh, allocated to them. So uh, we were extremely hands-on in which we, um, I have c two examples. One, we had a Liberian family, some sisters that really couldn't bridge the gap. So we went to their home, literally went through the application with them, filled it out, and they got a grant. We had another uh, uh, business that is uh, Southeast Asian. Um, they were in St. Paul. We literally took one of our members in our cohort working space took the member with us so that she could translate for us, and we actually were able to um, get that business 
um, also uh, fill out the application, complete it, and, um, and also they got a grant as well. So that's the extent that we will go to in order to make sure our clients uh, and members are able to bridge that gap. Senator Smith, what's your plan to create, promote, and measure real changes in ensuring equitable access to opportunity and financing for black and minority-owned small businesses in Minnesota? Well, thank you, Harry. And I just want to also start by saying what a treat it is to be with, uh, my, with my colleagues and to be with Warren and to be here with all of you today um, talking about this really important issue. And you know, I want to start, um, Warren, you're talking about the hands-on capacity of community-based organizations like NEON to connect people in North Minneapolis to and, and around, you know, this is true all over the country, um, to, to connect them to the opportunity that is there, which doesn't just happen automatically. And it's the power of community based organizations like NEON. And I think that the story that you just told really illustrates that. So I start from the place that everybody in this country ought to have the, a, a fair shot, an opportunity at starting their own small business. And what it takes and what their ability to be successful should depend on the power of their idea and hard work. And I mean, let's be clear, there is no deficit of great ideas in North Minneapolis. There is no deficit of hard work. There is, there is no deficit of determination and drive and ambition. There is a deficit of opportunity. And that is the challenge that we have to overcome. Okay, so how do we overcome that? Well, we know for sure that there is a huge challenge with access to capital and cash flow. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, really illustrates that. A typical black entrepreneur is going to start a business with about $35,000 in capital, which is a third of what a white entrepreneur is going to have to work with. On average, black and Latinx and native and other minority households have so much less wealth. So where are they going to draw from? Well, they're, gonna, they're not going to be able to draw from their own wealth all the time. And so they're going to have to go find um, investors. But that doesn't happen. <laughs> because those investors don't know about those businesses. And in fact, this is the systemic problem. So what do we do? We have got to expand access to capital. We've got to support CDFIs like MEDA. We've got to support community-based organizations um, like NEON. We've got to expand black-owned banks. And, and create more opportunities for businesses of color and families of color to have relationships with banks. This is something I think is so interesting um, that if, if you just look at the, about the, the how much um, banking relationships people of color have compared to white people and the opportunities that they have to get a mortgage, it's dramatically different. Mm -hmm. So this is the number one thing that we have to work on. I also just want to say quickly a couple of other things. We've got to make sure that federal lending and small business programs are reaching um, black and um, people of color businesses. And you know, you were talking about PPP. Um, we know that those first rounds of PPP loan forgiveness didn't make it right. to yeah. small businesses in right. North Minneapolis yeah. right. and other communities of color around the country. And so in the second round, we worked um, you know, Ilhan and I and others work to say, no, we've got we've to set aside resources so that it doesn't just um, you know, skip by right. this, um, you know, communities that need this, need, you know, that they're going to build something really powerful with these resources. Um, we also, I want to say one other thing that we can do is we need to do such a better job of expanding access to federal contracting opportunities for black and brown and people of color um, uh, businesses. Now, the Biden-Harris administration has made a pledge of hitting 50% improvement by 2026. That's a good goal, but we got to enforce this. We got to right. make sure that it's actually happening, yeah. which too often it doesn't happen. That's right. And then the last thing I'd love to have a fuller conversation about with people is what about creating some sort of a small business equity fund that we could work on at the federal level? My colleague Elizabeth Warren suggested this during the presidential campaign and, um, um, last year. And uh, to, to, in a systemic way, address the systemic lack, lack of access to capital by really doing something about it at the federal level. So those are some ideas that I have. Great ideas. Thank you.
And, and when you're talking about um, the federal contracts and things of that nature, uh, that's really, really important when you're talking about government contracts in general because the government, whether it's at the federal, state, or local levels, are the largest um, yeah. uh, entity handing out contracts. So if you're a business, you, this is what you need to survive. But that's true. But here's the other thing that's true. The government is deeply implicated in the discriminatory conduct mm -hmm. that created the problem. Mm -hmm. Look, yeah. it's, it's just a fact. For six decades, the Federal Housing Administration said, we will only insure mm -hmm. houses with restrictive covenants. Mm -hmm. they, the government did that. Right. The government segregated us. The government's why your neighbor's not a person of a different ethnic background than you. They, Take Levittown, New York. They said no blacks can move there. Cannot. And this happened all over. I, may I recommend to everybody a book uh, called The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. Great book. Read it. Just read that book. And then, you, because sometimes we have these conversations, and Tina's excellent comments get met with the attitude well, it'd be nice if we do some charitable stuff for the blacks. <laughs> that is so untrue. We're talking about deep seated, prolonged, racial discrimination. It is right to do these things. It's just, and if people want to see the documents, they're there. Mm -hmm. speaking, of, That's right. speaking of the documents, um, back when I was uh, at my former uh, employer, Insight News, uh, I had the opportunity to interview you when you were uh, the representative of the fifth. And in your office- By the way, I could not be happier with the person who took over the job. She's killing it. <laughs> <laughs> She's killing it, y'all. In your like office, you had that. Thank right, you. buddy. <laughs> Teamwork. <laughs> You had that document, and by that document, I'm talking about, the, and specifically to this conversation, the map from, I believe it was 1932, mm -hmm. the planning and zoning map. That's a map. municipal map from the city of Minneapolis, yeah. which designated North Minneapolis as a Negro slum. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't, they, all, them, all of them will be renters. They will not be able to build equity which you then can use to start that business, right. which is why you got a third of what other folks mm -hmm. have. And none of us in this room did it. The current leader of the FHA didn't do it. All those people are dead and in the grave. But we all live with the legacy. But it endures. But it, right. And it endures. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, our next question, um, Attorney General. Uh, a key component of your work is to create and enforce an environment of fairness and fair practices right. for equitable competition in Minnesota's business community. What implications does this role have on small, black, indigenous, people of color owned businesses in Minnesota? Well, let me tell you, if there's one thing that I really want us to start thinking about is the incredible market concentration that we've seen over the last 30, 40 years in, in nearly every industry in America. This is not great news for any entrepreneur of any color. This is not great news for any woman owned business. This is not good for any small business. It's not good for any small farmer. It actually limits, it stagnates pay, it uh, limits innovation, and, it may, and it's why you pay more money than Europeans for internet service, right? So we need to do something about market concentration for the benefit of free market commerce, right? It's not good to have these four industries controlling name and industry, right? It's not a good thing, it's not healthy, but it hurts black and brown businesses even more. And I'll give you an example as to why. Say, for example, you get one company who buys up, say, 200 residential properties in North Minneapolis. Which is happening. Mm -hmm. It's not an accident that I'm using this example. <laughs> <laughs> say they just, they got the cash, they just buy 200. After 2008, all these houses are up for foreclosure. They got the dough. Bam. And then they say, uh, we're going to move the market because we can. Everybody has to pay 25% more in their rent. And, you don't, and your landlord is not the lady next door no more. It's some nameless, faceless entity out of some other place. Now imagine yourself being just a person who owns one rental unit. You now 
are competing with that other person, you now have to, and, and you're the, say you're there to do good service for folk. Well, this other one, since they're nameless, faceless, and got an army of lawyers and accountants, they can let the property slide. They can ignore the city inspections. This is your competition as a landlord. My point is, if you're in it to try to do good, first, you're probably going to get squeezed out. And second, you're going to be outcompeted for, 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 for uh, renters. And then, from the standpoint of you as an entrepreneur wanting to have a strong, vibrant economic base, that base is being weakened as people pay more and more and more of their income to rent with less and less and less quality, including greater exposure to health hazards like squirrels. We took somebody named Stephen Meldahl to court, try, you know, we're waiting for the outcome uh, because of a scenario like this. We're looking at others like this. And none of these folks get to build equity in their homes because mm -hmm. a big giant entity just jumped in and started extracting wealth. I'm saying that our, our Minnesota, and I don't care if you're white as the moon or black as the night, everybody in between, we are weaker because of this kind of phenomenon. So you ask me, you know, uh, what, we, what about market concentration and competition? I mean, you know, I, I could go on and talk about black hair care products. How many black uh, companies now sell even hair grease? How many sell hair extensions? Do we not buy hair extensions? If you go buy eye long eyelashes, nowadays that's the, that's the fashion. Uh, who are you buying them from? Or skincare stuff. I mean, it's, it's really remarkable how market concentration mm -hmm. has made it extremely different, difficult for entrepreneurs of color, even in products that really only black people buy. You know, so, I mean, um, we could go on, but uh, those are just a few examples. Okay. That's why we yeah. need neon. That's why we need <laughs> neon. <laughs> and that's why well, we also need some enforcement. Mm -hmm. Yes. Exactly. And that's why we need enforcement, enforcement. and we need mm -hmm. neon. And that's why we need pro-competition government. If Adam Smith, the single, the, the most iconic capitalistic thinker you've ever heard of, was against market concentration. So don't let anybody tell you this is pro-capitalist. It's actually anti-capitalist. Monopoly is anti-capitalist, right? So anyway. Representative Omar, in early July, you advanced five amendments through the House of Representatives appropriations process with significant ramifications for Minnesota's fifth district, including a $1 million community project funding request to invest in NEON's food business incubator facility. Now, the bill has passed the House, and it's been received in the city. Uh, what's the on-the-ground impact of this appropriation for community and in a place like North Minneapolis? Well, thank, thank you, Harry, for, for that question. And, and thank you, Warren, um, for that additional introduction earlier and for your partnership um, and for giving Talia a shout out. Uh, in our office, we believe in co-governance. Um, and so that is why you hear so much from her um, and from you know, our other staff, because we, we do want to hear the kind of impact that the policies that are being debated will have on the individuals that we represent so that we can actually um, create impactful uh, policies uh, on behalf of our constituents. And it's really great to be here with Senator uh, Smith and Attorney General Keith Allison and with all of you. So when um, we heard that earmarks were sort of coming back in the name of community projects, we were really excited and we um, started a process of getting community input um, and requests to come in. We got over 200 mm -hmm. requests that came in to our office, but we were limited in selecting 10. Um, and we knew that NEON had to be one of the um, projects that we selected in advancing uh, and securing that um, you know, money for. Because to us, it is clear that not only is access to resources uh, crucial in creating a prosperous 
uh, North Minneapolis, but addressing the, the kind of need that this particular funding would was really important when you think about North Minneapolis being the fifth largest food desert, yeah. Yeah. Um, to know that uh, this incubator project was going to um, you know, help benefit people who are creating opportunities for there to be healthy, sustainable food resources accessible to folks in, in North Minneapolis and make sure that those resources you know, stayed in the community, um, it, we, we had to push for it. Uh, and now that it, it's passed, the, the house, the ball is on the senator's court. <laughs> I'm pushing for um, this mark in the Senate. This to is one make of my sure projects. That it gets yeah. here. Um, because we have the opportunity really to not only get this billion dollars, but to also get, you know, eleven point five billion um, that we secured in, in the House, passed in the Senate, uh, that will prioritize resources coming in to the most disenfranchised communities, which is, you know, North Minneapolis and South. And you kind of touched on it, but you said you had so close to 200 um, requests, and uh, of those, NEON was one of the uh, entities that uh, received the appropriation. What stood out about NEON's request and the, the need for investment in North Minneapolis? I mean, so it's no secret, right, um, that, you know, North Minneapolis, as the senator said, doesn't have shortage of ideas. It doesn't have a deficit of people who are willing to work hard, but it does have a deficit of resources and investment and opportunities. And NEON is, NEON's mission is to close that opportunity gap for these entrepreneurs that need the capital to be able to advance their businesses um, and to serve the communities that they live in. Uh, and the, the kind of projects that we were looking for were projects that will expedite the opportunity creation and the investment that our communities desperately needed, especially um, communities that have been historically disenfranchised has been um, disenfranchised. And so uh, NEON stood out, one, because they fit into the model of what we needed to invest in. Um, but secondarily, they put forth a really amazing proposal. Um, and I remember actually talking with the chairman of the subcommittees on uh, appropriations and he said it was the best proposal he's ever read. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, I, and I really think that underscores, right, how, how important it is for um, organizations like NEON to be given the opportunity by, you know, members of, of the House, Senate, um, and even locally elected here to put forth these kind of proposals to have the, the, the support and, um, and, and to be able to, to succeed because they've got great ideas. They know how to present those great ideas and they're addressing an, an extreme need because in, in those conversations, people were shocked because when you hear Minneapolis, you hear opportunity and prosperity. It is one of the most progressive cities in our country. People think everyone who's living in Minneapolis is thriving. So when I sit in front of my colleagues in these conversations in Congress, and I know Keith probably used to have this problem, they are always shocked when we explain the kind of disparities that exist here in Minneapolis for black and brown folks. Nobody imagines Minneapolis will have a neighborhood that has the fifth largest food desert, right? Nobody imagines that Minneapolis is the third worst city for a black person to live and thrive. And so these kind of projects are getting a chance to be funded because they are addressing a long neglected disparity 
uh, that, that could have been addressed if we continue to have the proper conversations about why these disparities exist and what kind of investments could be made directly into these communities so that we can close the disparity gap. So, so when we're talking about investment, um, people look at it in different ways when they hear investment in North Minneapolis. Uh, some look at it as opportunity. Others look at it as being pushed out and the, the actual word is gentrification. How do we have, and this is open for the panel, how do we have this level of needed investment without gentrifying and giving access to the North Siders who have been, many of them, second, third generation North Siders? So how do we make sure that we protect the North Side for them and grow it for them at the same time? Well, one thing I'll say is we cannot tell North Side people, and I live on the North Side, you cannot tell people on the North Side you can have prosperity and investment or you can have the status quo, but you can't have prosperity and investment and stay where you are because you like it. We, people are entitled to both. And there's a lot of strategy that we can pursue to not displace people as we invest in the community, including things like it, True investment, if you want, like it, the Met Council used to say, if you, want, if you want us to help you build this housing development, you're gonna have to have, take a certain amount of, of affordable housing. We really don't connect those things the way we used to. Maybe we should start doing that again. And I think that, you know, we just have to make sure that, in, in, that, that, that um, uh, gentrification really means displacement. It doesn't mean the absence of investment. And we, and, there's a, and we can do this, it's been done. There are models that we can adopt. But I, but I urge people who don't want to see displacement to not simply reject, and, and uh, who don't want to see displacement, don't just reject investment because you fear. You know, if you look at Heritage Park, which is probably the biggest investment in North Minneapolis in the last 100 years, um, it's actually pretty nice, I mean, if you've ever, who's driven through Heritage Park? <laughs> it's really nice. I mean, it's kind of nice, right? I mean, it's beautiful, like, uh, like water, you know, like uh, wood rain gardens and playgrounds and good housing. It has as many units as it ever did. The, who remembered it? Who remembers the old, the old thing? Right. So you remembered it. It kind of looked like army barracks, didn't it? And now it looks a lot nicer. My point is, um, that's a project where we did not displace people. People who live in there, they were the first right, they had the first right under the Holman decision to come back. Mm -hmm. Not all did, many did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you got some market rate homes over there that uh, actually I, was, I saw something for sale. I was like, hmm, maybe I should get a tour. <laughs> but my point is, uh, you know, it's, it could be done. We have to commit to do, to do it, though. And that's what we got to do. Well, and isn't and, it also that you're, I mean, are you creating opportunity for, you know, new people to move in and be able to achieve that opportunity? Or are you truly creating opportunity for people who live in the community, who right. is, it is their home? And I mean, as I listen to this conversation, I can't help but think about this massive disparity of income and wealth that we have in this country, um, in North Minneapolis and everywhere. That is, again, as you said, Keith, this is a this is a this is designed into our system. It is not like it didn't just happen by accident. And so we had the choice then to pursue policies that are going to address that. Now, as we're having a conversation about entrepreneurship and how we expand entrepreneurship in communities of color, black and brown communities, we don't often think about, okay, what are the other things, like what do we do? For example, if we made sure that everybody could afford childcare in this country and it was universal, would that not help all yeah. entrepreneurs, yeah. black yeah. entrepreneurs? Yeah. If we said that we ought to forgive $50,000 of college debt, which I support, is that Cancel not going to help create <laughs> You know, um, that, that's all, these are the kinds of broad-based policies that are going to make sure that as, yep. as good things happen in North yep. Minneapolis, the folks that live here are going to be able to participate in that because they have, uh, they ha again, they have the opportunity. Yep. So one thing I, we're doing, though, specifically is that we have a commercial development fund that we just launched mm -hmm. this past April. It's $1.4 million in that fund right now. And, uh, Auto Bremer Trust has been an investor in that fund. 
um, um, J. N. Rose Phillips Family Foundation seeded the fund with a million dollars. And so the fund is focused exclusively on BIPOC developers, and frankly, black developers, in North Minneapolis exclusively. And so and what they're doing is buying commercial properties that we're providing their pre-development funding for, which is the biggest gap in terms of trying to get a project funded. So that we're doing that now. Right. And we just um, funded, um, we just approved a loan this last week for $200,000. Um, and then we approved the loan uh, the month before for $200,000. So we've already uh, about to deploy about $400,000 for funding in that area. So. I mean, and, and I will just add uh, by saying, you know, when you are thinking about the kind of investments that need to be made or the opportunities that need to be created for a particular community, it is important for that community to be part of the conversation right. of what kind of opportunities right. and investments that they want. And I, and I think that a lot of these conversations around gentrification um, sometimes are creating fear for communities to even ask for the kind of investments because of fear of displacement. So I'm carrying you know, legislation in, in the House that creates an acquisition fund um, for places like North Minneapolis and South Minneapolis uh, and many of the other communities that have been um, disproportionately been impacted by the uprisings of, of last summer to say that when we are creating development redevelopment opportunities in these communities, we want to give the, the first right to community members that want to help redevelop their own community so that you're not having a lot of those resources leave out and other people come in. Uh, and, and I just think that when we have holistic conversations about opportunity for community, um, we end up with you know something that is that is beautiful, it's better. Uh, but we we have always been stuck in making decisions for people without them, mm -hmm. and that creates a, a cycle um, that you know has has failed a lot a lot of our communities. A lot of young people will say anything done for us without us is it's being done to us. us. Yeah. That's right. Or, or, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And, and when we're talking about development, the other thing that we should be talking about is making sure we're a part of the workforce when that development comes, exactly. is that's going to help to sustain the community as well. Yeah, I'll just say, you know, I agree with everything everybody said, but from the standpoint of just making sure people are banked, improving wage rates, making sure that people have public investments like child care and health care, if people don't have to spend all of their discretionary income on rent and child care and health care, they can buy more pizza at the food places that you're trying to fund and yeah, Warren's yeah. trying to do, and they buy more pizza, you sell more pizza, you sell more pizza, we need people and more people making pizza. Yeah. <laughs> now you're adding to the employment. So this, so a strong, so I guess the point is, talking about small business is, is, is you can do it, but you, if you don't talk about the, general health of the community and economic health is what I'm talking about, you, 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 do, create, you do create difficulties uh, in terms of sustainability. But also when you're thinking about the, the creation of these opportunities and, and businesses being created, like when, when we're talking about food deserts in, yeah. in North Minneapolis, is that $30 million per year yeah. to, to per, in, the, in, in the purchase of food leaves the community. That's right. So now if there were, uh, places where people can buy food in North Minneapolis, that's $30 million that's staying in the community that is employing right. folks in the community, right? Um, and putting equity back into the pockets right. of community members. And so it's, it's a cyclical conversation that we only get to have from you know, one angle and we right. don't complete that, that full cycle. So we're coming to the close. Um, we just got started. <laughs> <laughs> we can stay. <laughs> At least I can stay. <laughs> I don't know everyone else's schedule. Um, we've talked about a lot, and we have a lot more that we need to be talking about. And the key thing when, we're, when we say talking is the verb of doing. So talk without action is, is, is a waste of time. 
and uh, I don't believe any of us came to waste any of anyone of your time. So I appreciate you coming to talk and I appreciate the action that you brought with you. Um, I wanna thank each and every one of our guests uh, for their insights and for their time. Um, Warren, how can the audience stay engaged in this conversation? Well, first of all, I want to uh, once again thank our sponsors for uh, for supporting this because without them, we wouldn't be able to hold these hold these meetings. Um, so, thank you for that, um, and also um, their support for their support and commitment to building equity and business development, economic justice, and collaboration in North Minneapolis. You can learn more about Neon's work, the Grow and Thrive Northside campaign, what lies ahead for North Minneapolis, at neon-mn.org. Support Neon's work with small businesses and entrepreneurs at neon-mn.org forward slash grow hyphen thrive hyphen north side. So if you can uh, access those, go to those particular um, websites, um, you can um, learn more about our campaign. And in the Grow and Thrive North Side campaign, 2020 showed us the importance of investing in small businesses and organizations that support them. Neon's Grow and Thrive's North Side campaign is a catalyst for building a stronger North Side and creating equitable access to opportunity. Key investments in North Side's capacity and infrastructure will position us to better support small businesses for many years to come. We look forward to sharing more about these efforts and how you can get involved in the coming months. Um, and I, I invite you to, in, uh, to contact Neon's team and, and myself um, and involvement in the Grow and Thrive North Side campaign. You can call 612 746 4150 or email us at grow at north uh, grow at neon hyphen mn dot org. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, I want to uh, personally thank uh, the members of this panel for not being present right now, but continuing to be present as um, a journalist with a community newspaper. It is often a challenge to get, in, get a hold of certain people in certain positions. To a person on this panel, I have not had that challenge. And I'm appreciative. <laughs> I'm appreciative of the genuine concern that you have for North Minneapolis and for Northsiders. Um, I, I talked to Senator Smith, I talked to Mark in your office almost on a weekly basis. Representative Omar, I talked to your office and you all have been very accommodating to me both in my previous role at Insight and my current role at North News. And as I mentioned, um, you were then representative, now Attorney General Keith Ellison, your door has always been open to local media and we appreciate that. So again, thank you for your continued commitment to the North Side. Thank you. I'd like to thank Warren and Neon for hosting, and please join Warren on November 12th for Northside Live, an annual reception held this year at the Minneapolis Event Centers. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us on the first installment of Neon's Community Conversations Series 2.0. I say the first installment because it absolutely will not be the last. All right. Thank you. Thank you to the audience for joining us, both in person and those who are watching the live stream. Great. Awesome. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. I would love to.